Hello, everybody. Hello, hello. Unmute. Yeah, and then start your video. So start you the video. Know. Where's the video? Sure. So hover over this. You see that slash? That means your video is not. Hey, Jim. Hey. Hi, Tyler. How you doing? Doing well. Okay. So, uh, so it's okay to uh, say maybe next week. We can say next week. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because particularly, we wanted to do it for a week from next week, which is when we get this hot shot from Pittsburgh Seminary. He's oh, going nice. to be here for four days. Okay, so he'll be here the last week of January. He'll be here the last week of January, but okay. he'll be the convocation speaker, and. Uh, uh, but then a lot of other stuff. He's going to be here for four or five days, oh, okay. so it's kind of a big deal. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so I, it's I really hope we get in person then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I'll work with the AD guys and see what we can do. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think next week you and I are doing this together because if, uh, my my granddaughter. Yeah. Terry is going to be gone. Right. And uh, Barbara Massey will be. Yeah, I'll help you out. But if you could help out, yeah, that would be great. For sure. Of course. <laughs> All right, Jim. All right. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Hey, Jim. Uh, I have Stuart in the waiting room and an account called 5100. Do I need to admit either of those? I'm sorry. I said this dog is, I'm going to put the dog in the. <laughs> If she doesn't knock it off, I'll put her in the bedroom. But say it again. I have Stuart and uh, an account called 5100 in the waiting room. Should I admit one or both? No. Uh, the ones we want are M, uh, M. Chase. Okay. That's our speaker. Okay. And Catherine Hughes. Okay. And Terry McGonigal. I think those are the four. So you got me. Uh, Terry McGonigal and I think that Catherine and Catherine Hughes, he's at her house helping her with it. Okay. And then the other one is Mark Chase. You, yeah. Here's Terry. Okay. Great. And then while we're here, I'm just going to go ahead and test the scripture here. Let me. Oh, yes. Pull yes. that up. Hey, Derek. Yeah. Hi, how are you? Doing well, thank you. Okay, there is the scripture. All right, Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves. Okay, yep. Great. Yep. One away. Okay, that's good. And so now we're just waiting on um, Catherine. Got it. Catherine and, and Mark Chase. Mark Chase. The, the speaker, Mark Chase. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I've emailed him twice to remind him about the 345. Okay, that's good. Catherine says she had a hard time communicating with him. Well, uh, so. let's, let's <laughs> hope we don't have a hard time communicating with him at four o'clock today. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Does do either of you know who it is that has an account called 5100 5100? Um I've seen that account before. Yeah, I have also. Um that might be Catherine. Hmm. Okay. Uh shall I admit and just let's take a look? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. Are, are you at home, Terry? No? Yes, I am. I'm home oh. right now. Okay. So Okay. You know, I had to get uh, Edgar to come over here and hook me into this because the link that was sent from uh, Jonas didn't work. Okay. Usually it's a blue color, it's a little off color, you know, and then you click on it, you get right in mm -hmm. and uh, so uh, bless his soul he came he came came over here and uh, and figured out how to do it but 
anyway. Yeah, I don't have any info on how or if the links have changed. It looks like it's the same one. Well, the numbers are the same, but it the numbers and the letters were the same. Hmm. But it didn't. It, usually, it's a, a little blue color, a little, and you click on it and you get it right in. Well, it it was just black. And, oh. oh, okay. That means the the hyperlink may not have transferred over. Yeah. 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 Okay. All right. All right. Well, I'm walking away for just a second. I'll be right back. Okay. Okay. I just uh, texted Catherine. If we get to 350 and she's not on, I'm going to walk over. Okay. Okay. You know, I, I, the Edgar, uh, said something about, well, we're, we've, we've all agreed to uh, start in person in Marwick in February. So when he came over, I asked him about it and he said, well, uh, uh, that's, well. I've been emailing with him about that. And he's saying that once we go into Marwick, we're going to use a YouTube channel. Yes. And so I, I said, I'm going to let, let you and, work on all the technical details and please be very clear with Jim um, uh, and then copy me on everything. Yeah. Yeah. I saw that. I saw that. And well, then anyway, when I said we had hoped maybe to do it next week and certainly by uh, the time we get our speaker from Pittsburgh to come. So uh, he hope. said, okay. So, so he said, well, okay, then that's not out of the question. He yeah. said that's possible. So okay. Right. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> well, you're are you all set to go tomorrow for your uh, week? Yeah, I yeah, I, and I the, the article I was writing on uh, Shalom the city, which was do um, finish that up this afternoon. So I've been working on that for about a month. So um, I did case studies of how Shalom works out in, in four cities, uh, Babylon, Jericho, Antioch, and Ephesus. Um, so that, that all wrapped up this afternoon and I'm just packing. So yeah, I'm, I'm pretty, pretty well ready to go. Okay. <laughs> Here's Mark. Oh, there's Mark. Yay. All right. That's good. Hi, everyone. Mark. Hello, Hello, Mark. Hello, Mark. Good to see you. <laughs> thank you for joining us. We're very grateful. Oh, thank you. Thanks for having me. We uh, we met at one of the CCC conversations. Oh, were you there yesterday? or, or I this? was there. I came in late. Um. Uh, the the rain shorted out my garage door opener, so okay. I had trouble getting my <laughs> oh, car no. out. And then I had to leave early because I had to go had to go do a graveside uh, service down in San Gabriel. We've gotten very close with a Ukrainian refugee family that's moved here since the war started. So I was got in late and left early. So I I saw you across the room when you when you did self when we did self introductions. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I, I heard you mentioned that you were from Monte Vista. I was like, oh, I'll be there tomorrow. Yeah. I thought about that. So, yeah. right. How's, uh, how are things going today uh, with this? Everybody feel good? I think we're doing wait. Yeah. Um, okay. So yeah, you, you, okay. I'm just trying to get Catherine in here. Um, yeah. The only other people I have. Yeah, Catherine, been... Catherine is 5,100. Oh, great. I will add her now. Here we go. So, so Mark, uh, I, my name is Jim Simons, and I, uh, my wife and I are are uh, involved with All Saints, and we've enjoyed your preaching oh, a lot. You. Oh, your last you. your last sermon on uh, the power of the silence of Joseph. Ah, oh, wow! Thank you. That was that was really good. And That's greatly encouraging. Thank you for saying yeah. that. Yeah. 
and I've got a couple of grandchildren that are acolytes who are at All Saints. And uh, nice. Then my their brother, the older brother, was was the youth one of the youth preachers. Oh two wow! And half, two and a half years ago. Okay. So uh, so my daughter's family is definitely heavily involved at All Saints. I love it. I love it. Yeah. And hey, Catherine, also known as Fifty One Hundred. How are you? Good to finally meet you. Yes, likewise, likewise. How's it going? We've got everybody Hi. in. Yes, that's good. And the technology's <laughs> working. So, <laughs> hi, Catherine. Hi. Hi, Catherine. Hi, Jim. Catherine and I live so close to each other, it's almost as if we opened up our windows, we could hear each other <laughs> talking <laughs> right now. I love it. I love it. That is wonderful. How are you? How are you feeling about the event, Catherine? You feeling good about everything? Oh yes, everything's going to be great. All right. I just feel it in my bones. Yeah, there, there you go. go. <laughs> and is this is this a weekly event? Yes. Yeah, weekly, uh, yes. Uh, and next month, you know, we will be observing Black History Month all week, all month. Mm -hmm. so I hope you'll be able to tune in. We have some great speakers. I love yeah. it. I love it. We're Catherine, say say a word about what we heard last Thursday from Richard Bell. Oh, yes. I, I don't know, Mark, if you are aware of the five free slaved uh, boys who were kidnapped and I believe it was 1865 and enslaved again. 18, 1825. 1825. Uh, and uh, Richard Bell, who is an anthropologist as well as an author, has written a book and it's entitled Stolen. Mm. And it chronicles their lives. Um, four of them, one of them was murdered right uh, soon after. Oh, yeah, it's, it's a story of their being captured and taken to the South and then eventually, as I understand it, Catherine escaping and making it back north. Um, wow. Oh, there you go. You're back. There we okay. are. Yep. There, there you are. That's good. Okay. Well, in terms of format, um, uh, Mark, I, I'm, a, I'm a chair of the convocation committee and work very closely with Jim and Catherine on a number of events. Uh, Jim will be uh, reading the scripture and praying and then Catherine will introduce you, and then you're off and running. Um, and uh, you know, I'd say go around 45 minutes. We have, usually have a very interactive bunch, and they'll either be posting questions on the chat or raising their hands when it comes time for Q and A, which you know anywhere between 4:40 and 4:45. Um, um, Terry. Yeah. I had told him 35 minutes and 15 minutes for Q&A. Now, okay, and, and, and we're, we're flexible. Anyway, the, the cutoff time is five o'clock. So well, that's great. Uh, whatever, whatever the spirit moves in you, Mark, <laughs> you go right ahead. But that, that those are kind of the parameters. Got it. Should be good. All righty, everybody. It is 3.55. Uh, we are five minutes away. I'll check back in when it gets to 4 p.m. Um, and when it does get to 4 p.m., I'll allow all of the people who are in the waiting room in. Uh, and then around that time, I'd say give it uh, 40 seconds or so. Make sure we get everybody in and then we'll be good to go. Okay. All right. I'd say go ahead and let them in, you know, open it up about one minute to four. Okay. Then we'll roll from there. Did you say, uh, okay, I've got about two minutes to the hour. I'm fast, I guess. Yeah, yeah I think you're a little fast. It's 3.56 is what my computer clock says. Yeah, that's, that's what I've got at 3.56. Okay. Mm. I've been on the phone all day um, advertising. 
Oh, good. <laughs> we, we sent out flyers to the uh, National Black Presbyterian Caucus, all of the ministers. So. Well, thank you, Catherine, for doing that. How do I change that? Can Terry, do you know how to take that 5100 out of my name and put Catherine Hughes? Uh, there's a control button. I can come over and do that okay, for you no, at some okay. point. Okay, afterwards. We don't want to do anything to mess with this. Don't want to mess with anything right now, no. <laughs> so, so, ter so Terry, am I going to start this? Yeah, you go ahead and start it right at four o'clock then, Jim. With That's a welcome? Fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, Catherine, I can I can tell you how to do that just so that when we're finished here, you can you can take a look. Um, if you hover your mouse onto your window, your video window. Uh, are you telling me to do that? Oh, no, I'm, I'm just uh, letting you know the steps so that when you're finished, you you I'll, can navigate it. It will okay. be in here and out here. So okay. tell okay. it to Terry. Go Thank ahead. You. So you just, you just hover over the window, right? Yep, there's the uh, ellipses button or the more button that's in the top right corner there. And at the very bottom of that list, there is rename. You can do that. Okay, thing. got it. I don't know how, that's the address of St. Paul's Presbyterian Church in Los Angeles, where oh, I okay. a few times. All right. And I became the address. Yeah. Alrighty, it is just about 3.59. Once it hits 9, I'll go ahead and allow everybody in. Okay, great. We're good to go. And then we'll take a minute after that. Yep. All right, 59, we are go. Everybody looks so earnest. Hey, Jim, you might remind everybody at the beginning just to mute their Okay. Mute the microphone so we don't get that background noise. Okay. I think we're ready to go. Yeah, I'd say go. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Jim Simons welcoming you to our weekly convocation here at Monta Vista Grove, a series of programs sponsored by the Residents Association of Monta Vista Grove Homes. And each year, uh, the Thursday nearest to Martin Luther King observance holiday, we have focused on the words and deeds of Dr. King. And that is exactly what we are going to do today. Now, before we get started, I'd ask everybody to mute themselves for the program. And then when we have the Q&A at the end, you can unmute but uh, please uh, mute yourself at this point. And our speaker today has suggested for our scripture, Luke 18, 9 to 14. Jesus told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. 
Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves and rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. Oh God, we hear these words and admit that we sometimes say, or at least think, we are good and they are bad. We are smart, they are dumb. We are right, they are wrong. Hmm. Oh God, help us to join the tax collector in saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. And today we remember Dr. King and his call to humility to see ourselves joined together around the world as one communion of human beings, one community of many races, languages, and beliefs, one tapestry of many colors, all blending themselves beautifully together. Well, we, we pray, O oh God, today that in your spirit we are indeed one. One. Mm -hmm. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Catherine Hughes will introduce our speaker for today. Catherine. Thank you, Jim. And good afternoon again, everyone, wherever you may be. It is my pleasure to introduce the speaker for this afternoon. He has several titles, and I'm impressed with all of them. So I will use all of them to introduce him. The Reverend Rector Pastor Mark Chase received a Master's of Divinity degree from Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. Pastor Chase is deeply committed to pursuing racial justice, pursuing the real Jesus, and helping to dismantle the burdens of white supremacy and the many ways it manifests itself within ourselves and our communities. Pastor Chase has spent the last several years of his pastoral ministry experience at Fellowship Church in Monrovia, California, and at Fellowship's Center for Racial Reconciliation. He has drawn he was drawn to All Saints Episcopal Church, where he serves as associate rector because of the church's history of being a prophetic witness for the marginalized, as well as its recent history of providing a safe refuge to those advocating for black lives. In addition to being a pastor, he is also a poet, a writer, rapper, husband, and father. This afternoon, Pastor Chase will share with us how the words and the actions of the late Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. relate to our lives today. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like for you to receive in love the Reverend Pastor, Rector, Mark Chase. Please receive him in love. Catherine, thank you so much for that introduction. I would love for you to uh, introduce, introduce me in uh, various contexts. That was uh, really beautiful. Thank you so much. It is my honor and privilege to, excuse me, it is my honor and privilege to be with y'all this afternoon. <clears throat> Bear with me a little bit. I am 
a little slightly under the weather today. But I couldn't postpone because I was sick the last time I was supposed to preach here. So I couldn't do it uh, two times in a row. So I may need a break uh, to grab some water. Take your time. Hmm. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Thank you again, Catherine, for that introduction. And I want us to get started with uh, some of the words of Dr. King himself, where he says, quote, the aftermath of nonviolence is the creation of beloved community. <clears throat> the aftermath of nonviolence is redemption. The aftermath of nonviolence is reconciliation. And the aftermath of violence is emptiness and bitterness. We must come to see that our ultimate aim is to live together as brothers, sisters, and siblings under God, and not to live as enemies. I'll say that last uh, phrase one more time. We must come to see that our ultimate aim is to live together as brothers, sisters, and siblings under God and not to live as enemies. Our aim is to live together as brothers, sisters, and siblings under God, and not to live as enemies. Uh, Monte Vista, on this day, as we remember and look toward and draw inspiration from the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we must remember his belief <clears throat> excuse me, and his labor for the beloved community. <clears throat> the beloved community rooted and grounded on connectedness, shared self-worth and dignity, justice and freedom for all. And today's scripture helps us because it reveals to us something that's at the heart of the opposition against beloved community. And that's something that we all take part in, that I myself take part in, and are tempted to take part in each and every day. And if we're honest, if I'm honest, uh, this parable of Jesus resonates. And I love that prayer that you prayed, uh, Jim, because we all know that there are people we wake up thankful not to be. Let's just keep it real. We all know that there are people who we look to and who we look at in order to establish a sense of rightness about ourselves due to the obvious wrongness about them. As a matter of fact, we'll do this all over this Zoom room. Uh, let's just start with some honesty and confession this afternoon. Uh, just raise your hands, let's be bold. We gotta call it out. Let's practice some courageous truth telling and just raise your hands if there are mornings. And I know this is Southern California, so maybe this will resonate, but just raise your hand if there are mornings you wake up thankful just not to be a UCLA Bruin. <laughs> or maybe, maybe, maybe you're on the other side of the spectrum. You wake up thankful that you're not like those, those USC Trojans, right? Or maybe there are some of us who we wake up thankful, especially with the way things are looking this season. We wake up thankful not to be like those poor Los Angeles Laker fans. Oh my goodness, uh, if, if, if you're a Laker fan, just blink. Oh, I'm so sorry, Sister Catherine. I will be praying for you. Or we might wake up thankful that we're not a member of one of those other uh, communities like Astoria Park, Fountain Glen, or Morningstar. Maybe some of us wake up thankful that we're at Monta Vista and not somewhere else. Maybe uh, you grew up in Pasadena Anybody grow up in Pasadena? Any, any hands? Anybody grow up in Pasadena? I know there may be some folks who aren't on screen. Maybe you wake up thankful that, that you're a, 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 a Mustang and not a bulldog or a bulldog and not a Mustang. I know for me, I wake up every day grateful that I grew up just outside of the Bronx and not just outside of Queens. Otherwise, I might be a New York Mets fan instead of a New York Yankees fan. And that would just be a miserable, miserable existence. But you see, we all intuitively and explicitly understand that there are people who let us know that we've gotten it right 
simply because they've so obviously gotten it wrong. Some of us, and we go a little deeper with this, some of us, if we're honest, we may thank God, especially during certain times of year that we're not a Republican. Some of us, especially certain times of year, I, I saw a hand go up right there. I didn't even ask for, I saw a hand shoot up. Some of us, maybe we're on the other side of the spectrum. We thank God, especially certain times of year that we're not like those Democrats. And I know I hear what you're thinking, especially about those last couple, but I'm right, I'm right, I'm right. But beloved, the stunning conviction of this passage would seem to be that rightness does not equal righteousness. The stunning conviction of this passage would seem to be that rightness does not equal righteousness. You see, the Pharisee in this parable had a whole lot that he was right about. You shouldn't rob people. He got that right. You should generally avoid doing evil. He got that right. He avoided adultery, got that right. He fasted twice a week when by law, he was only required to fast once. He got that right. He wasn't a tax collector who, excuse me. He wasn't a tax collector who economically exploited the very community that raised him. He got that right. and. And y'all, he gave a tenth, a tenth of all he made back to his religious institution. Now, I'm a church minister. You know, I'm going to say he got that right. <laughs> so we got a whole lot right. And Jesus, yet and still, says that when the eyes of God looked around, she still didn't see righteousness. All that rightness. And Jesus says, that when the eyes of God looked around, she still did not see righteousness. It's kind of like this. The year was 2004, and the place was Athens, Greece. And 23-year-old archery champion Matthew Emmons was on his way to an Olympic gold medal. Now, he had so dominated the competition that Going into his final shot, all he needed to do was place his arrow anywhere on the target, and the gold was his. He set his sights, he took a deep breath, and he sent his final shot hurling through the summer breeze. Bullseye. Someone had just won the gold. Only thing is, it wasn't Matthew Emmons. For in the course of all his aim and in the course of all his efforts, <clears throat> on that fateful final shot, he had allowed his sights to wander. <clears throat> and though he'd hit the bullseye, he had taken aim at the wrong target. And even though he'd hit the bullseye, he'd still lost the competition because he'd hit the bullseye on the wrong target. Friends, could it be that Jesus is telling this story because he knows the human tendency to allow our sights to wander and to take aim at the wrong target? For in the economy of God and in the uh, beloved community that Dr. King dreamed of, the target is not rightness, but the target is righteousness. I'll say that one more time. Could it be that Jesus is telling us this story because he knows the human tendency to allow our sights to wander and to take aim at the wrong target? For in the economy of God and in the beloved community that Dr. King dreamed of, the target is not rightness, but the target is righteousness. And the bullseye on the target of righteousness is repentance. The Pharisee in our story had hit the bullseye on the wrong target. You see, some of us don't, again, don't, don't raise your hand across the Zoom, just, just, just blink. Some of us, if we're honest, we need to repent of our rightness. 
Again, don't raise your hand, just blink. And if you're sitting next to somebody, now is the time to resist the temptation to elbow that person in the gut. Some of us though need to repent of being right. Some of us are right so much that it's no wonder we've got so few friends left. The target in God's economy is never rightness, but the target in God's economy is always righteousness. And the bullseye on that target is repentance. Y'all, this past November was crucial. <clears throat> there were lives and liberties at stake. And no, I'm not going to say like never before, because the truth is, Black people in America face the types of political crossroads that so many people in America were at this past November. They face it election cycle after election cycle. So it's not new, but that doesn't make it any less formidable. But regardless of where you fall on the political spectrum, if we're honest, what we're witnessing all across the globe and particularly in the West, and certainly here in the US is the seductive and brutal pull of authoritarian rule and of fascism. Now, fascism in particular, and I'm gleaning from the work of author and journalist Isabel Wilkerson, as well as author Jason Stanley, fascism in particular thrives off of a few things, included but not limited to alternative facts and alternative realities. Everything is true and nothing is true all at the very same time. Fascism thrives off that. Fascism thrives off of a disdain for academia and intellectuals and of science itself. It thrives off a desire and the need to keep populations pure through a control of who one is and is it allowed to marry. Fascism thrives off of a story of a glorious, mythic, patriarchal past whose legacy and whose purity is being threatened by a new group. And lastly, uh, and what applies to our context today, fascism thrives off of inherent hierarchy, an inherent hierarchy that needs natural divisions of us versus them. Fascism needs an us and fascism needs a them. And rightness and self-righteousness, like we see in this story, will deliver it up every single time. Beloved, as Audre Lord reminds us so famously, the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And for the sake of argument, let's just say that maybe in some instance uh, they could. The master's tools will certainly never build anything more beautiful and more just and more loving than what needed to be dismantled in the first place. And as James Baldwin reminds us, the trouble we are in is greater than we imagined because the trouble is in us. I love that James Baldwin quote. I'll say it one more time. The trouble that we are in is greater than we could have ever imagined because the trouble is in us. So as we resist the fascism out there, we have to take inventory of the ways in which fascism may be shaping us in here. Because in God's economy and in the beloved community that Dr. King dreamed and labored for, the target is not rightness, it's righteousness. And the bullseye on that target is repentance. Uh, Mona Vista, I'll, I'll tell y'all a story. <clears throat> a few weeks ago, I was helping my kids to brush their teeth and Y'all, we got this whole routine uh, at our house and a little song that we brush our teeth to. It's a whole routine that I created and I'm super proud of it. And on this one particular occasion, I'm helping our five-year-old and I'm telling him, Ezzy, make sure you brush in the front, buddy. You got to keep them nice and white. And y'all, how many people know that toddlers will tell you the truth? Any ever hung out around some toddlers? Toddlers will tell you the truth about yourself. And so as we're brushing, he pulls out his toothbrush. And he looks at me in the mirror and says, but daddy, how come your teeth are yellow? Yeah, he, he really said that. He said, daddy, how come your teeth 
are yellow. I, I'm, not, I'm not joking around. He looked me square in the eye and said those exact words. In other words, uh, my little five-year-old was saying, Daddy, I know you ain't talking. And what this passage shows us, if we let it, uh, is that when we examine ourselves with sincere humility, I heard someone talk about the humility that Dr. King uh, advocated for. But when we espouse that true humility, what it shows us, what this passage shows us, if we allow it to, is that we've all got some yellow somewhere. The tax collector says, God have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, whether or not the language of sinner uh, is your favorite or not, isn't really the point. But the point of the story that it lets us in on is the reality that at some level, we are all deeply problematic. And I know that we're on Zoom, but but just look at your neighbor or maybe just look at yourself in that Zoom, um, in that Zoom screen and say, did you know you were problematic? I know somebody been waiting to say that to, to somebody they're sitting next to all day. <laughs> and if you're by yourself, just say it to yourself. Did you know you were problematic? <clears throat> this text lets us in on the reality that we are all problematic at some level. And that's okay, because so am I. We are all problematic at some level. As my son Ezra reminds us, we all got some yellow. Y'all, as a Black, cisgendered, heterosexual man, I have to name the ways in which I've got some yellow and have been and continue to be problematic towards the progress of other people of color, towards the progress of Black women, and towards the progress of my Black LGBTQ plus siblings. And if I don't name those things and repent of those things, then by default, much of my liberation pursuits fall short. And I can't enter into and help facilitate beloved community. Because y'all, I'm not aiming, at least I hope I'm not aiming, just to have patriarchy work for me as a Black man, the way in which patriarchy works for white men. No, at my core, I don't want patriarchy to exist, period. And if that's true, then it's not enough for me to say, thank God I'm not like those dudes who don't get it. I got to confess and then repent of the ways in which I still don't get it. And I'm still problematic. I'm still problematic. But the good news is I'm also still in progress. That's right. Look at yourself or look at that same person you looked at a few moments ago and says and say, I'm still problematic but I'm also still in progress. Oh, you can say it. Somebody needs to hear that today. You may be problematic, but you're also still in progress. And, you know, just to uh, keep it all the way real, one of the most people, one of the people that I most like to thank God that I'm not like is my former self. That old me from however many years ago that isn't the me that I am now. That's if I'm honest today, um, across this Zoom, that's the person I most thank God that I'm not like anymore. Now, there are times when that testimony is what we need to say to ourselves and what we need to encourage ourselves with. The old saints uh, in the church I grew up in used to say, I I'm not all that I want to be, but I thank God. Oh, you know what I'm talking about, Sister Catherine. Uh, but I thank God that I'm not all that I used to be. Right, So there are times and moments where that's the testimony that we need to say over our lives. <clears throat> but there are also times and moments where, if I'm just speaking honest, honestly for myself, there are times where I don't go to a place of encouragement with that message, but I go to a place of shame. And I'm ashamed of that old me from however many years ago that isn't the me that I am now. But one thing that I'm learning is that if we can't hold compassion for our former selves, then it is difficult to hold compassion for our current selves because compassion, love, grace, and mercy, uh, they don't flow from different faucets right? It's like if you turn on the faucet in, in, in your home, you got, a, you got hot water and then you got cold water. But at some point, all those things that they're passing through the same passageway. 
And it's the same thing with our souls, right? So if we can't have compassion for our former self, then guess what? Our lack of compassion for our former selves will lead to a lack of compassion for our current selves. Because who we are now is built on who we were then. And the people we were back then need love and compassion too. Uh, just like the people we are right now. And if we can't hold compassion for our former selves, then we also guess that here it is now, here it is now. If we can't hold compassion for our former selves, then we also can't hold compassion for anyone who reminds us of our former selves. Ain't that the truth? It's tight, but it's right. If we can't hold compassion for our former selves, then we can't hold compassion for anyone who reminds us of that. And I'm far from a therapist, but the spirit of the living God is, is blowing us in some therapeutic places. So I'm just going to go with it. Y'all, there are times when the resentment and judgment we hold for others is really resentment and judgment uh, for parts of ourselves that we wish never existed. So often the, the resentment and judgment we hold for others is really a projection of parts of ourselves that we wish never existed. And we can spot it in other people so easily because we know how much we spot it in ourselves all the time. And it's easier to deal with it in somebody else and to judge it in somebody else than to confront it in ourselves. Am I, am I talking to anybody? You ain't got to raise your hand. Just blink. Just blink. Thank you. I see those blinks. I see those blinks. So where are the places? And here's the other thing about that. When we release, when we release others from judgment, we simultaneously release ourselves from that same resentment and judgment. So the question is, where are the places where Despite all of our progress, we still need mercy because we're still problematic. This is one of the pivotal questions for beloved community. God is calling us to true belovedness, not just togetherness, but true belovedness and true beloved community. And in beloved community, the beloved community that Dr. King dreamed and labored for, the goal of that target is not rightness, but it's righteousness. And the bullseye on that target is repentance. Where are the places that we as people and as communities need to repent of our rightness in order to step more deeply into God's righteousness? Now, the good news is uh, somebody in this story goes home. There's, there's good news, there's good news. Somebody say, good news, good news. There's good news. Somebody in this story goes home justified. Somebody in this story goes home righteous. Somebody in this story goes home exalted. And you know, one of the prem, prep, uh, tenets of the opposite of beloved community, which in many ways in our American context is white supremacy, one of its tenets is binaries. Talked about good, bad, us versus them. And it's tempting to go into binaries about righteousness. As we constantly rack our brains trying to figure out if we should check the box next to hero or villain. But the good news of this passage is that it reminds us that none of us are holy heroes and none of us are holy villains, but all of us are holy humans. I'll say that one more time. The good news of this passage is that it reminds us that none of us are holy heroes and none of us are holy villains, but all of us are holy humans. That's the good news in this passage. And we are in a relationship with a God who, through Christ, is chomping at the bit to have mercy on us when we acknowledge and confess that humanity. So this afternoon, Monta Vista, I know I'm getting ready to close. I know we got Q&A, but I'm, I'm getting ready to get up out of the way. This afternoon, Monta Vista, I'm so glad for the good news of God in Christ. I'm so glad that we're still in process, but God still got mercy. I'm so glad that though our rightness couldn't save us, Christ's righteousness still didn't skip us. 
Oh, I'm going to say that one more time. It felt good to me. So I'm going to say it one more time. I'm so glad that though our rightness couldn't save us, Christ's righteousness still didn't skip us. I'm so glad that the power of the blood of Jesus doesn't bow to the false power of false binaries. I'm so glad that the creator, redeemer, and sustainer didn't look down and be thankful just to not be like one of us, but loved us enough to become exactly like us so that we might become exactly like them. I'm so glad that beloved community came down from heaven, became flesh, and lived and dwelt among us. And that same spirit lives in each of us today. I'm so glad that there's good news this afternoon, that though we are still in progress and in process and still problematic, the grace of God is able to overcome our problematic nature and to make us into the image of Christ. I'm so glad. Come on, come God on now. Is it finished with me yet? Oh, y'all can unmute and give God a praise up in this place if you feel the good news the way that I feel the good news right now. Yes. Amen. Preach. Amen. Amen. I'm so glad that God is not done with me and God is not done with you and God is not done with us. Hallelujah. So as we remember the legacy and look towards the legacy of Dr. King for inspiration, Uh, Let us be grounded in these words of Jesus in the same way that Dr. King was grounded in the words of Jesus. Let us remember that the the target within that beloved community, the target on that bullseye that we're aiming for is not rightness, uh, but righteousness. And the bullseye on that target is always, always repentance. Mm -hmm. In the name of the creator, redeemer, and sustainer, amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Mm. We can give yeah. God some praise. Amen. God, a handshake. <laughs> yep. My voice held up. I made it through. <laughs> yeah, we were praying for it. <laughs> I felt those prayers. Thank you. And so uh, I think now uh, we'll go into some question and answer. Give me one second. I'm going to cough and drink some water. But anyone who wants to throw a question out, just go for it. Jim, are you going to moderate this section? You got to unmute, Jim. Why don't you moderate it, Terry? Go ahead, Terry. You moderate it. Well, Mark, thank you uh, very much. Um, it's, It's clear that you have taken into your bones um, so much of Dr. King's spirit because as he fought this incredible battle for justice and righteousness and equity and reconciliation in our country, he was always aware of the things that you've reminded us of today, that that those who may stand against us are not our enemies somehow the power of love has to transform fractured relationships into reconciled and beloved community. Um, So thank you so much for that. Um, Nancy Mackey, I know you had a question in the chat. You wanna uh, come on and and, uh, interact first? So here's, here's uh, Nancy's questions, Mark. Uh, what are some signs you see that racial relationships are healing? What type of messages of grace do you share in your writing and rapping? Yeah, that's a great question, uh, Nancy. Um, what are some signs you see that racial relationships are healing? And that, that is, it, that's kind of a tricky uh, question because I think one of, and, and and I'll lean on the the wisdom of a really fascinating book by Eduardo Bonilla Silva entitled Racism Without Racists. Uh, this is a, a, a really, really uh, fantastic book. 
and it's comprised of uh, just thousands of hours of interviews and data with different people in different generations across different areas uh, of America. And the central premise of this book, uh, Racism Without Racists, is that post-1965, post, uh, post the civil rights era, one of the things that you saw shift in America with the passage of the Civil Rights Act um, and other uh, incredible pieces of legislation that really made America a democracy for the very first time, uh, what you saw was there was an attitude that we had uh, entered into a post-racial society, that with the passage of uh, the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, uh, with the passage of these laws, we had entered into uh, a society in which racism was no longer an issue because uh, racism had essentially been solved, right? And with that, there, the, you know, the people's attitudes and hearts were said to be uh, better concerning race and racism, particularly those of white people. Uh, and what Eduardo Bonilla Silva shows is that uh, when, when it comes to racial sentiment, uh, the attitudes and the feelings of many people haven't really changed beyond uh, the, the surface level, right? So when you really think about a, uh, that question, what it really uh, speaks to is, well, have people's attitudes about race changed dramatically or have they not? I think that's a question that, that that question leads me to. And I think we saw in 2016 that many people's, specifically large segments of white society, uh, while of course leaving room for white people to be individuals, right? Uh, but large segments of white society's attitudes about race uh, had not changed so much so that uh, a president who was openly and admittedly uh, bigoted, ableist, Racist, uh, was able to be elected with a large uh, portion of the Christian evangelical vote, right? So when I think about that, and I go back to the words of Dr. King, especially in the latter uh, speeches, if you listen to his late speeches, a really great book to read is uh, The Radical King. It's by Cornell West, and uh, he kind of anthologizes all of Dr. King's speeches and kind of lays them out on a trajectory. Uh, and he has different people read the speeches. It's a really great book. And I think it might only be available on audio, but it's a great book to kind of listen to. And you, you hear all of the speeches of Dr. King. Uh, and in his late speeches, um, what you hear Dr. King begin to talk about more and more is uh, matters of economic justice and economic equity and how those are the things that are the foundations for a society in which the other community can thrive. So I guess the long answer to that question is uh, for race relations to truly be healed in America, it's going to take uh, economic justice, economic repair, it's gonna take reparations, and it's gonna take true equity in order to, to, to really build the foundation in which uh, relationally, uh, our hearts can truly be healed and mended and beloved community can, can truly actually exist because relationships can't be healed if the harm and the, and, and if the repair for the harm in the past has not been, has not been righted. So that's a long answer, but I am a preacher. So, I mean, you, you gotta expect long answers from a, from a preacher, right? So <laughs> thank you for that. Um, what types of messages, of grace do you share in your writing and rapping? I think um, that is, I think th that premise is something that I try to do in my writing, rapping and preaching all the time is to share a message of, of grace. Uh, <clears throat> because as I, th this sermon really hit home for me uh, <clears throat> because at some, you know, we're all human and no matter where we find ourselves uh, at our deepest levels, uh, we all need grace, right? And we all, and, and none of us, uh, Brian Stevenson says this all the time. 
And it's one of my favorite quotes. Uh, Brian Stevenson, the leader uh, and founder of the Equal Justice Initiative. If you haven't heard of Brian Stevenson, he's incredible. He, he um, have anyone ever seen the movie or read the book, Just Mercy, right? Incredible book and they made it into a movie a, a few years ago. Uh, but he has this quote where he says, none of us, none of us are the worst things we've ever done. None of us are the worst things we've ever done. And he's saying this in the context of working in the carceral system to free people off of death row. A lot, so, a lot of folks who are not guilty, some who are guilty, but nonetheless whose lives are sacred and holy, right? Who he's working to try to save. And I truly believe in that message. And so um, whatever context I'm in, even when I'm talking about things like uh, white supremacy and anti-Blackness and systems and structures, I make sure, and again, this is to, to, to quote the words of Dr. King, I make sure to uh, differentiate uh, and, 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 and remember that it, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. And it's not people that are evil, but there's evil working in people and there's evil working in systems, right? And so when you have that understanding, uh, it enables you to show up and to show grace. And that's what I try to do in my sermons. That's what I try to do in my writing and, 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 and in any form of communication that I'm engaging in is to just remember that we're all, that we're all human. And I need that same grace, right? Because otherwise I'm like that Pharisee in that story. I could easily forget the places and the intersections where, hold on, I hold systemic power. Like, you know, um, I'm a man. I'm able-bodied, uh, I'm middle class, I have a college degree, you know, so there are some social things that are working in my favor, and if if I forget that, that there, there are those intersections of power, then, you know, I, I will end up uh, not receiving the grace that, that I myself need, so that's a great question, thank you. Another so, Mark, long here's, answer, but... here's another one, uh, <laughs> and this is coming from my wife, Suzette, what... Uh... What do you see happening here in Pasadena regarding racial reconciliation that gives you hope? Oh, that's a great question. <clears throat> you know, a few things. Number one, All Saints Church. Uh, uh, All Saints Church here in Pasadena, that, that, that might feel like a shameless plug, but it's true. Uh, All Saints Church here in Pasadena, historically white church, historically progressive church, uh, and is really, really trying to uh, dismantle white supremacy as it exists in its, inside of itself as an organization and as an entity. And, and one of the ways in which All Saints Church is doing this is, um, and we've talked about this kind of briefly at All Saints Church before, but we're engaged in a, a campaign called Tell the Whole Story, in which we're telling the story of our land and how we got to be on our land, uh, because this is uh, the, the land, the, uh, the original stewards of this land were the Gabrielino Tongva people. And so we had a Tongva historian come to All Saints Church last year and talk about the history of this land that we're occupying. Uh, and we're in conversations with the Tongva. And so we're, we're trying to tell the whole story of our land. And then also to tell the whole story of our iconography and the images that are on our windows, uh, because we are on, pa on paper and in our mission statement, uh, uh, an all-inclusive church. But if you come into our church and you look at the windows and you look at who's represented on the windows, it's all white faces. And so one of the things that we're trying to do is to tell the story of, well, how did that get to be? And how do we go about changing that so that everyone is represented? So that gives me an enormous amount of hope. If this uh, white Episcopal church in Pasadena can examine itself in that way, that gives me hope that the spirit of God is, is moving and, and doing something. Uh, also, uh, the church that I was at previous to All Saints has a great ministry called the Fellowship Center for Racial Reconciliation. And they're doing some incredible work around the subject of racial justice and racial equity uh, and racial reconciliation. And as a matter of fact, we're partnering with them this coming Sunday 
uh, at the forum at All Saints at 9 a.m. And we're going to be talking about the history of housing discrimination and redlining and its impact on African-Americans in Pasadena. So we're going to be talking about that. Pasadena. This yeah, mm -hmm. we're going to be focusing on Pasadena. And we're going to be talking about that uh, at the forum. Uh, and then we've got a great historian who's going to be helping us uh, tell that story. Uh, Pasadena, San Gabriel Valley, La Cañada. Uh, this is right here, right? And so those things give me uh, a lot of hope uh, regarding this subject because uh, there's some mm -hmm. folks in Pasadena who are just doing some great work. So my good friend and mentor, John Williams, is at the Center for Racial Reconciliation and, and everything they're doing over there and what's happening here at All Saints is, is really, really hopeful. And that's Thank and you. that's the that's the other thing. Uh, it's Suzette. I'm glad you asked that again. Sorry, preacher. You get a preacher answering question. We just don't go. It, it is so crucial um, to keep track of the wins and of the places where good work is happening and where progress is happening. Because when it comes to equity, uh, justice, and social progress, <clears throat> it can feel like nothing is happening. It can feel like we're going backwards. And in some instances, that might be true, but we have to keep track of where there's hope. We have to keep track of the wins, because if we don't, hope is, to me, is hope is a spiritual discipline. And if you don't practice the spiritual discipline of hope, uh, it, it can lead you to a place of despair. And despair never really leads you to action. Despair always leads to inaction. Right. And so this is a principle that is true of social progress It's true in our own individual lives. We have to practice the spiritual discipline of hope. And even if there's progress, even if that progress is like a centimeter, we got to celebrate that <laughs> centimeter. You know, at our house, we, we got the little measuring things for our for our kids and they're measuring themselves and they're looking. And if they grow, you better believe if it's a centimeter, they're going to stay on. They're going to shout out that centimeter. So we need to have a childlike faith when it comes to hope and progress, right? In our individual lives and in, in, and in society, if we see a, a centimeter of progress, then we have to celebrate that centimeter and then move on to the next centimeter and then the next centimeter. So hope is really crucial to this work. So that's a great question. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Catherine, you were going to jump in? <laughs> yes. Um, I'm just trying to figure out how to phrase my question. Um, in our society today, and as you've mentioned, we're faced with problems of race and, and gender and sexual orientation and economics and all of those things. Uh, yet when I try to find a Bible study that deals with those issues, what I usually find are Bible studies that are talking about love and forgiveness and repentance and all of those things but it's not connected to the race and the gender and, the, and those things that we're faced with. So how do we get the two together? Uh, and we get uh, Bible studies that strictly deal with, with the Bible on the issues that we're dealing with today and not a booklet written by someone who tells us how to think on these issues. Because I'm learning that so many people who have read the Bible have not really read the Bible. And they quote things that really are not there. It's not that it's not true, it's not there. And if you ask them to go back and read it again, they still come back with the same answer. So how do we how do we connect that? That wow, that is a, a question that <clears throat> folks have spent lifetimes trying to answer. Um, and I, I'll, I'll say this: the first place where we connect that is by reclaiming the body and the person of of Jesus, putting Jesus back in his context. There's a great book, and this is, you always got to start, I, I, it was pressed into me that as often as you can, you, you got to start with Jesus. And so I'm going to start with Jesus. There's a great book uh, by Obery Hendricks uh, mm -hmm. out of Yale Divinity School entitled, mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Obery Hendricks is a professor at Yale Divinity. It's entitled The Politics of Jesus. Jesus. 
And it's a, it's a fantastic book. And what Dr. Obery Hendricks talks about is, uh, and this is going to justify all the student loans that I took out to go to Fuller Seminary, right? But I remember learning about uh, this, what now uh, is looked at historically as uh, a heresy because, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it isn't congruent with our faith in, in Christ. So there was a heresy uh, <clears throat> at the time of the early church floating around called docetism. And docetism essentially tried to reconcile uh, the suffering that Jesus endured uh, in his body with Jesus also being uh, a divine being, right? And so the ways in which they reconciled this, because they couldn't make sense of it. Uh, number one, uh, in Greek philosophical thought, which a lot of Christian thought was heavily influenced by, the body wasn't always viewed in a positive light to begin with. So the fact that 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 there is this person named Jesus who people believe is the son of God, but who also has to go to the bathroom, that was problematic, right? And now this same Jesus is crucified and publicly humiliated and executed on a Roman cross. So they're trying to make sense of this. And so the, the conclusion that they come to is that Jesus didn't really have a body, but he just appeared to come in bodily form. He didn't really suffer and die on the cross. It was just kind of a phantasm, kind of a ghost that just kind of, you know, appeared to be suffering, but it wasn't really Jesus. And so they stripped Jesus of his bodily context. And Obery Hendricks says that in, in, in today's Christian, specifically, but not limited to evangelical culture and white evangelical culture, we have, we have committed political and social docetism to Jesus, meaning that we have stripped Jesus or Jesus has been stripped of his political and social context. And so when you realize that Jesus uh, was a, a Palestinian Jew under Roman occupation, so Jesus grew up in a community and in a neighborhood that was over-policed, so much so that it made it into Jesus's teachings. Jesus says, suppose that you are walking uh, and, and, and someone asks to, to borrow or to take your coat. And then they take your coat. And then, and then, and then Jesus says, well, give them, give them your backpack too. Or suppose someone uh, asks, tell, tells you, carry my backpack one mile. What should you do? And Jesus says, offer uh, to, for them to, to carry it two miles for, the, for them instead of one. Well, what was Jesus talking about? That was a real situation. The hearers of Jesus's parable would have known exactly you know. what Jesus is talking about because Roman soldiers who police Jesus's community could commandeer a citizen or anyone walking around to carry their gear for them. And so what Jesus is saying in that parable, he sees giving them back dignity and choice. He's saying it's a kind of sarcastic. Oh, you want me to carry your backpack a mile? Fine. How about I carry it too for you? You want me to take you all the way to the Walmart? Right? And so the first place, again, sorry for the long answer, but the first place, uh, uh, Reverend Catherine, that we have to kind of merge those two things back together is by putting Jesus back in his body and putting Jesus back in the social context in the reality that he lived in. Jesus was poor. Jesus, before he could even walk, was a refugee who sought political asylum in Africa, mm -hmm. right? And so when we bring back together the, the person of Jesus and stop, as Dr. Obrey Hendricks says, committing political and social docetism, that is when we can begin to bring these things back together. But, but I would recommend that book and then another great book by Richard Rohr, it's a really short read, but it's really, really fantastic. It's called "What Do We Do with the Bible?" Uh, the, the Richard Rohr book is is a, is I would say it's a little it's a lot more readable and accessible than Aubrey Hendricks is. Like, you ain't going nowhere for a while. Just just sit down. It's a whole course. And Richard Rohr, you could probably read through that in about a, a few days. But "What Do We Do with the Bible?" by Richard Rohr. But that's a great question. I recommend those two books but starting with the person of Jesus and, and getting him back in his context. That's Richard. What's the last name? Uh, Richard Rohr, R-O-H-R. Uh, okay, thank you. Absolutely, thank you.
Okay, let's get uh, Bill. Uh, go ahead with a comment or question, Great. reaction, and then we'll we'll Thank kind of wrap things up. Thank you. I needed that message. Rightness is the target. No, no, no. Righteousness is the target, and repentance <laughs> is the bullseye. I needed that. Uh, I want to know uh, any counsel you have, or that you think Dr. King would give in a situation. Uh, within our own family. Our oldest granddaughter is married to a biracial man who is a doctor, he's a, a podiatrist, uh, this good looking strapping guy. They walked into a restaurant in the San Diego area, have not named it, and were told that they would not be seated. How do I respond with hope and not despair? Uh, even to tell the story almost uh, brings tears to my eyes. Southern California. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Wow, wow. And that is directly one of the things that uh, Dr. King labored for was for Jim Crow apartheid in the society where that was a everyday reality to no longer be the case. So I would say the short answer that I would say, Bill, in the time that we've got left is to uh, what can you do because uh, I know it might be a difficult situation for uh, the, your, your son-in-law, was it, who was biracial? Is that what you... Yes. Yeah, yes. it might be a difficult situation for your son-in-law. Grandson, I'm sorry, grandson-in-law. Grandson, to advocate for himself. But where are the places where you can leverage your social standing and your social location and advocate on their behalf? Maybe it's you writing the Yelp review and saying, this is what happened to my grandson and he might not be in a place where he wants to to take it up any further, you know. But but you're saying no, I'm gonna I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna write this review. Here's my face and picture. Like we can't we can't stand for this, right? And so I think what Dr. King would say is, as the beloved community, there are moments and places where we have to hold each other up together in solidarity and not leave each other alone uh, as we fight against these systems and against discrimination. Uh, and anti-Black racism. So I think what Dr. King would say is, or the question Dr. King would ask, uh, Bill, is what is your role in being beloved community for your grandson in this moment? I think that's, I think it'd be more of a question because I can't tell you what to do through Dr. King. I wouldn't even try, even as a preacher, I don't try to tell people what to do. I think the Holy Spirit does that. Um, but I think a question that 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 could be raised is, how might I embody beloved community in this moment for for my grandson? I think that'd be I think that'd be a good place to start. And listen, we love that guy oh. dearly, but you helped me with the idea of a Yelp review, and I'm going to follow through on that. Thank you, thank you for your message today. Wow, powerful. Thank you. And Mark, I think I think that last question that you just uh, gave to Bill is an important one for all of us as we wrap up here. You know, what is it that each of us can do to contribute to community, not just internally here at Monte Vista Grove, but in the city of Pasadena? Mark, you and I, you know, we see each other monthly. We're part of the Clergy Community Coalition, a gathering of about 75 uh, pastors and ministry leaders, along with the police chief, the city manager, the, the mayor, the, the head of the police, uh, or excuse me, the uh, school district, uh, the person who's responsible for the sheriff's substation in Altadena, the health district. And, and we're constantly asking ourselves as a group this question, what is it that we can do to contribute to the common good to make Pasadena be the community that we want it to be for everyone? who resides here. So Mark, I'm glad to see you there. Uh, Al uh, from our community also uh, attends there, but there's the question that you've left before us. So I, as we conclude today, I think the ongoing conversation about reactions and comments and questions about our responsibility and our contribution is one that's gonna continue to, to develop. So we are very grateful for, for your guidance and leadership. Let me just give you a little bit of a, uh, uh, a trailer on next week. Uh, our own Jim Simons is going to be uh, sharing. Uh, the title of Jim's presentation is Justice with Jim. Jim's actually going to be interviewed by his own granddaughter, 
they've worked out kind of a call and response Q and A thing. Um, and we're going to hear about Jim's justice towards uh, Jim's journey towards justice in a variety of places and times, things that he's participated in that actually have changed the course of the conversation that we've been having today. So we look forward to seeing and hearing you, Jim, uh, next week. Let me just close this in a word of prayer. And again, thanks to you, Mark, for your uh, really provocative and, uh, and probing uh, presentation that's got us all thinking. Let us pray. Lord, there are, are moments in each of our lives and there's moments in the history of our community in the church and this country where we are called to answer the question, what is it that we can do and be to contribute to the kind of community that you desire, that Jesus came to create? So we pray that you'll give us compassion and courage. We pray that you'll give us wisdom and a passion for justice. We pray that you'll give us um, the kind of courage that we need to have courageous conversations. Because in the dialogue of those conversations, we believe that, that loving and caring communities can be created. So we don't consider this just one hour on a Thursday afternoon. We consider this the prompting of your Holy Spirit. So we place ourselves at your service and in your hands, our dear God. May we be your vessels for the sake of the beloved community. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks again, Mark. We please show our appreciation. We're very grateful. Thank you all so much. It's been a joy. Look forward to seeing all of you next Thursday afternoon. Blessings. Peace. Go in peace.